I'll talk today about AI monitoring and explainability and the hidden connection between these two topics. When people think about ML monitoring, deploy the model into production, uh, not you guys, but people who are less technical, they would think of it like everything's cool, the world is more like that. <laughs> and there's lots of things that can go wrong. There can be data bugs, data pipelines might be broken, the world might change. You might get one of these pandemics that we have recently seen, can break things in big ways. Uh, you can get new untrained use cases and shifting concepts and behavior and adversarial attacks. And all of that, uh, the harsh reality here is that the moment you put a model in production, it goes on a wild ride. And so monitoring is key. And as we talk about monitoring, um, the data science teams and the MLOps teams who operate or install and run these systems often struggle to minimize risk. And there's a whole bunch of questions that come up. How can I better understand how my models are working? How do I identify real problems with the model? What is the problem's root cause? How can I debug quickly? And how can I make monitoring work easily in any environment? So those are the three things that I'll touch on on the right there. Some of the struggles here, number one is with visibility and observability. So that is keeping track of metrics, making sure when the model is starting to go out of get haywire, you're getting alerts, you know that you should pay attention. But that's not where we should end. That's just the first step. The second step is really the deeper diagnosis, root cause analysis, and actionability based on that. Though that's kind of the workflow that I'll walk you through as we go along with examples. And then the third, which is a different dimension, which the platform folks in the room will appreciate is that all of these tools have to fit within a larger tech stack and complex ecosystem and workflow where you have diverse models, you have diverse stakeholders. So as we talk about monitoring requirements, there are a few, these are the three different areas that I just touched on. The first around observability is broad coverage of model and data quality metrics. That's number one. The next step is to have fast and precise debugging. And it's the connection between these two requirements where you see the emergence of this connection between monitoring and root cause analysis or, and, and explainability becomes a building block for that. So that's what I'll focus on in this talk. There is a whole other dimension on these kinds of platforms being easy to deploy and scale on which I could talk for hours, but that's not going to be the focus of today's presentation. It's the connection between these two, these two pillars. Great, so as we get into this connection, this is, these are the kind of the top level questions that I'll walk through. First, it's just spending some time understanding how drift happens, which is related to the metrics, the first pillar. What are the different kinds of drift? And also being able to characterize and identify drift that matters, that truly matters for the model's performance and therefore for business outcomes that depend on the model. In the second section, I'll talk about concrete measures to identify drift and challenges here. And then we'll go from there into root cause analysis and mitigation. And, and there you'll see that connection emerge between monitoring metrics and observability on the one hand and root cause analysis and debugging on the other. So let's dive in. When we talk about drift, what do we mean? There was a time when bikes used to look like this. Now they look more like that. And if you train a machine learning model on this kind of data and then apply it to that kind of data, will it work well? It's not a given. It depends quite a bit on what concepts the model has learned. If it has looked at these kinds of images and figured that bikes always have one big wheel and one small wheel, then it'll not generalize well. If instead it's looking for two wheels, 
than it might. So there is part of the reason that drift becomes a problem traces its origins to training data not necessarily looking like production data. And this is similar to what happened to models with COVID. This is an example of a risk scoring model. I'll, I'll work with three examples in today's talk. This is a credit risk model. I'll talk also about the Zillow example and uh, a third example with marketing models. So in this world, this on the x-axis is the risk score. Higher scores are, are, are indicate more risky individuals. On the y-axis is the density or the frequency of individuals who have that kind of risk score. In green is the pre-pandemic data. This is from, say, 2018. And you can see, for people who are processed by this model, there's a distribution of risk scores. Post-pandemic, that distribution has shifted right, meaning now the model is viewing the set of people as more risky on average. Now, when that happens, first of all, you want to be able to measure it. How big is the drift in the model scores in this case? And secondly, you'll want to understand why is that happening? Is the model still fit for purpose? I'll give you some examples based on real examples, which I, I won't be able to get you the details of the actual in-practice examples, but I can speak at a high level to give you some indication of what has been happening. So imagine this credit model where the risk has gone up a lot post-pandemic. Now if you can understand leveraging some root cause analysis and explainability technology, what are the drivers of the drift? It could be, in some cases, that the risk of this set of people have gone up because their incomes have dropped post-pandemic. A lot of people, our, their hours went down as a number, of, especially in the service sector, because of the pandemic. If that's the driver of the, of the drift, and the model is picking up on that and basing its scores on that, then the model might still be fit for purpose. If on the other hand, it's something else. So for example, consider the scenario where the risk went up because of differences in reduction in travel spending. So for example, it could be a credit card company. Many of their customers are frequent flyers. Historically, they see that when frequent flyers suddenly reduce spending on airlines, that's a strong indicator of risk. Post-pandemic, a lot of these people may have stopped flying because they are concerned about safety as opposed to uh, losing their jobs. And yet the model is not tuned to the new reality. So having this kind of view and the capability to answer these kinds of questions can then inform, take you from metrics, observability metrics, to the deeper root cause analysis, which can then inform mitigation. In the first case, the model did not require an adjustment. In the second case, it would. It would, in this case, involve potentially even dropping that feature or at least reducing its impact on the model's output. And this does require the data scientist and a human to be in the loop, to have visibility, and have some amount of domain expertise. It goes back to a, an important comment that uh, Peter Wang made in his talk today morning, which is one of the big reasons Python took off was because it was easy to have these kinds of interactive visualizations and have visibility into why the models were working in a way that domain experts could work with it. So that's one concrete example. Let me just give you a few others relatively quickly. You could have data quality issues. For example, broken feature pipelines. We have seen this in the wild a lot. For example, Retailers, sometimes their pricing models go out of whack because maybe they're selling on Amazon and Amazon has changed how it's encoding certain products. And the data pipeline of the retailer has not been uh, readjusted to reflect that change. You can have uh, the external world changing, the pandemic example, the credit risk example is one example of that. Zillow is another, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. Zillow has lost like $500 billion now because 
their estimation of the prices of homes were quite high. The world had changed, the housing market had cooled down, and they had not, their models had not picked up on them. This was combined with external factors as well. For example, that there were supply chain issues, it was hard to get contractor time, so they couldn't flip the houses as fast as they expected they would be able to. Often these kinds of business outcomes depend not just on the model, it also depends on what else is going on in the world. But some of that can get reflected in the model if your features are sufficiently expressive. And we have seen this in other kinds of settings as well with text data. If you train a model on Wikipedia articles and apply it to, to news articles, it may not work well. We have seen results from Google, for example, that some of the Im image analysis models that were used to do, say, diabetic retinopathy analysis, when you deploy them in the wild, they don't work so, so well. Sometimes it's because the scanning machines are different, so there's a bit of a, a context, a concept drift because of that. In some cases, the collected training data can be quite different. So for credit decisions, for example, uh, you, may, you may not have labels for the most recent decisions that you have, similarly for fraud models. So there's a rich set of examples here which outline some different elements of how drift happens. So if we get into a to the next level of detail, the training data is being used to train a model to predict a target. And now you can think of a few different categories of drift. There's data drift, which means that for example, that there's a covariate shift, which means there's a drift in the input features that are coming in. There can be concept drift, where there's a, the relationship between the input variables and the target variables have shifted. So the credit example I gave with the travel spending was an example of a concept drift. Uh, the one with the interest rate shift in the data, uh, sorry, the income, income shift in the data was more like a covariate shift, where the relationship still held true between income and credit worthiness. There can be model decay issues. For example, you might have a performance loss due to a data drift, and then there can also be prediction shift, meaning there could be drift in the model predictions, the scores. Of all the drifts that, of all of these kinds of drifts in the data, not all of them might matter to the model. So when I say consequential drift, I'm referring to drifts that truly matter from the standpoint of the model. So imagine this data distribution. In green is the data from September. In gray is the data from November. They look quite different. And in general, when you get to high dimensional data, there is always going to be some amount of drift in the data because it's a, it's a high dimensional space and there will be some differences and they will accumulate as you look across dimensions. Now, if you look though at the impact of this drift on the model's output, say the model score distribution or the, or the performance related metrics, it could either be that this drift matters and the model score distribution also shifts a lot as a consequence of that, and that's what we saw in the credit example from a few slides ago. Or it could be that from the point of view of the model, actually the model score distribution is very similar. That although there has been some amount of shift in the data, it does not impact the model's output. So imagine that, to give you a simplistic example, imagine that one feature, maybe, maybe something like the age of applicants, for a credit decisioning model shifts a lot. So the, the data, on, if you just look at the data, it'll look like this. But the particular model that is making decisions does not depend on that feature much. In that case, the model score distribution will not change. And so you might start getting alerts here. Your data drift metrics might start giving you alerts. But over here, you will not get as many alerts if you're tracking the model score distribution out metrics. So having more fine-grained control here is useful because you can sometimes avoid these kinds of false alerts. So, le so let me give, move on to give you a sense of how to identify drift. There are some standard approaches to measuring drift. I'm sure many of you are familiar with what I'm going to share. 
you could measure model performance in deployment. So you have a deployed model, you're keeping track of various accuracy metrics like Gini or AUC and F1 scores and so forth. And you can see that there, these metrics, you can suddenly see that these metrics are going down. Maybe your marketing campaign is not working so well suddenly and the performance is going down. Not enough people are clicking on your ads or uh, taking your coupons uh, at Lyft. <clears throat> so this is an observable, uh, for certain kinds of models, this is observable. You can also compare distributions of ground truth. If you have labels on your data, uh, then you can see how well the model is doing. You can compare single input features. You can compare predictions or model outputs. You can also compare full, full data sets. Uh, there are a number of challenges, though, to applying these kinds of metrics. So in many cases, you don't have ground truth, at least immediately, in order to evaluate model performance or do this first analysis with ground truth. So imagine a fraud model or a credit model. There is going to be a delay between when the model makes the prediction and when you'll get to know whether it made the right call. Similarly with many pricing models. This is actually very, very common. There's a delayed label problem in machine learning because of which the tracking of metrics for observability is non-trivial. Certain metrics will be lagging behind. If you're just tracking shifts in single input features, then you get to this problem which I was earlier alluding to as a consequential kind of drift analysis. If, if there's a say a 5% shift in some feature, does it truly matter? You might get lots of these kinds of alerts. Which ones should you prioritize? Where, where should you focus your attention? Looking at shifts in the prediction is great because it can tell you that the, there is a real impact on the model's output, but does that mean your model has degraded? In the absence of performance information, it will not tell you that. So you need that next layer of analysis to be able to answer this question, why is the prediction shifting, so that you can go on from there to make that judgment on whether it, the model needs to be mitigated, whether the model needs, a, needs an adjustment. And when you get, get to full data sets, then you start hitting the curse, curse of dimensionality. There's just lots and lots of features and tracking drift across all of them. You will get a bunch of metrics, but how do you interpret them? How do you act on them? How do you prioritize them? So let me start transitioning now to, oops. OK, we are back. <laughs> Did you do some magic? How, how do we mitigate? Yeah, question. Yeah, so that's a great question. So maybe let me hold on to that question because the mitigation part actually talks about measurement, like, like that next layer of detail on measurements as well as uh, the root cause analysis. So let me come back to that in a bit. Um, so maybe this section should not be just called mitigation. It's going to start showing a bit more detail. And there's not like one answer to that question, right? There's a range of methods for concept drift. Okay, so one of the things that I want to kind of leave you with is that the baseline method often is just retrain the model. As you get new data coming in, just keep retraining the model with the new data. That often is not the best answer to counter drift, and I'll share in a little bit why. What, what we would instead suggest you do is understand the root causes of drift. Where is it happening? When is it happening? How much is there? What is causing it? And this is the step where the root cause analysis leverages the connection with explainability. And then once you understand the root causes of drift, that leads to targeted ways to address drift. So, so let me touch on this a little bit, and we can 
uh, look at look at a few different examples. This is not meant to be exhaustive, but just illustrative. So first you may ask, is the drift being caused? What features are driving drift? Or are they being caused by an unstable feature? So we are focusing on prediction drift now. This is the example I had towards the beginning. There is a drift in the model score distribution. Uh, the, risk, the risk scores have started going up post-pandemic. And here are the drivers of drift. The annual income is a big driver. The revolving balance is another driver, uh, as well as another thing that's related to the limit. So if you think of annual income in this case, in this case, what we could do is drill down a little bit more and exactly look at how the distribution in annual income has evolved that's causing the drift in the model score outputs. And this is a place where we build on explainability techniques start based on Shapley values. Uh, and you can lift it from individual level explanations to like, distributional differences. Uh, that level of technical detail, I'm happy to go into more in the Q&A. But, but what that might tell you, the result of that analysis could be surfacing that what caused the shift in the model score distribution is that annual income has dropped for a segment of the population. In general, when annual income goes down, risk goes up for this model, and that was the root cause of why the model, went, uh, model scores went up. Now, in that case, what you might decide is that the model is still fine, and you, the, there isn't a way need to intervene on the model. Other things which we have seen happen, I gave you the example of the travel spending feature, which was the big driver of the, of the increase in risk scores. And that's an example of a concept drift. So the prediction drift root cause anal analysis, the, what you're measuring, if you think of the technical work here to answer your earlier question, in this case, the Prediction drift, when you look at its root causes, that surfaces the concept drift directly because what you can th see through this analysis is there is a big shift in model scores, increase in model scores, and the root cause of it is a shift in the distribution of, uh, of, of travel spending where travel spending has gone down to zero. And because of that, now, the, the, the do, this requires the human in the loop, right? The human in the loop can look at it and say, this relationship made sense when we trained the model at that period in time. Now, it doesn't make sense anymore because in the current pandemic world, sudden reduction to zero travel spending does not mean that our frequent flyer has suddenly become more risky. Um, there are a number of other examples that can come out of this analysis. The other one that I gave you was that of like in a retail pricing kind of setting where suddenly the pricing performance, the performance of the model goes out of whack. When you do the root cause analysis, it comes back to a specific feature that's the driver. And in that case, it was a data pipeline problem where there was an externality. The Amazon had changed its encoding uh, of feature values, and then the, internally the pipeline had not caught up with that. So, so those are some, some examples. It's not the only way to detect concept drift, but it's, it's very powerful, and we have now seen it, this kind of analysis, play out really well. <clears throat> so in the case of, uh, in some cases, like in that uh, airline spending example, what what travel spending example, what you could do is to simply remove that feature without retraining. You could actually un underweight the impact of that model on the, uh, of that feature on the model's output without impacting the models, uh, without requiring a retraining. In some cases, you'll want to retrain, uh, remove a feature and retrain with existing data. So we see sometimes, so some of this sometimes also in the context of fairness analysis where you might have a proxy for gender or race, 
uh, or some other protected feature in the model. And when you see some fairness metrics go out of whack, it can surface that there is a problem here and you could Sometimes you can address that simply by eliminating features. Yeah, question? Uh, so how do you find the importance of a particular parameter in the output of the model? Like in this case, it's simple, but like suppose there are like n dimensional features and uh, like the variance maybe is not so much helpful. Because in, for example, in linear regression, it's comparatively easy like to find the parameters for that. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. So sometimes the root cause analysis can show a diffuse effect yeah. where it's not concentrated all in one feature. It can, it can be spread across features. And in fact, this kind of analysis also accounts for feature interactions. That, that is very true, but often what we find is with models with hundreds of features, there are often a few features, <coughs> under 10 features, which end up being quite like the bigger contributors to, to the drift. It's not always going to be the case, uh, but empirically, this is part of our finding, especially with tabular data and models trained on tabular data, there are often concentrated effects. If the effects are more diffuse, then you'll have to look at more than, the, the approach will still work, but you'll have to look at, then at the analysis will have to be broader. So then you look at 20 features, 30 features, instead of just five. Is it supposed to not work in a scenario like a deep learning, right, where you don't exactly have features for different pieces of data and end up getting all the same? No, it can work in the context of deep learning as well, because I'm not sure what you mean by you don't in, input features. Because if you think about an NLP model, there are word embeddings. The word embeddings are the input features. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. You do. So what works there is instead of looking at the input pixels, inside of the deep net, inside of the deep net, they learn higher level features. I have some backup slides, I'll have to go into it in the Q&A. But you can start seeing higher level features inside of the deep nets. And those start shifting. So there is a different, uh, you can get a very similar kind of analysis, but at like intermediate layers of the deep network instead of at the input layer. Those are not trainable, right? Like those they can be, it depends on the model. So there are some very interesting connections between robustness of models and interpretability and their interpretability where if you train models with certain kinds of robustness constraints, then consistently higher level features that are learned tend to be much more interpretable. So for faces, you, the model will pick up on eyes and ears uh, and so forth. So let me uh, see if I have a, oops, I should not have done that. Uh, right. Where did it? Uh, it's still here. Um, will you be able to get it back on my screen? It's still up here. Uh, you can scoot it over if you drag it. Ah, okay, 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 got it. All right, I'm not so great with. Is it looking at the right? Oh, I can see it here. All right, let me see if I have a slide on that. Okay. Play from currents. This is what makes Orlando Bloom Orlando Bloom, according to this deep neural network. Inside of the network, it has learned concepts like it's, his, it's essentially his left eye and the lips. That's all. Everything else is redundant. Okay. How am I doing on time, Sean? 10 minutes. Oh, wow. Cool. 
This is where if you just use something like integrated gradient to answer your question, it wouldn't work for the reason that you are saying, right? Because at the pixel level, so some of you might be familiar with integrated gradients. This is a way to explain uh, input level explanations for uh, deep nets. So this was the original image over here. Let me see if this works. This is the original image, and its explanation is showing which pixels in the image the network is paying most attention to. This is why these are the pixels that are the most important from the standpoint of, of the model, of why this is a camera. And then, like what you said, if you were to just build on this kind of technology, then it would be a, not a very good analysis because there's going to be thousands of pixels and like most, like half of them are going to be important and that'll not tell you much. But what I was just showing you is based on some internal explanation work that uh, we did at CMU a few years back and there's related work in the literature as well, which looks inside of the networks which, where the higher level concepts are learned and you can start seeing drift at that layer. Great. Let me see how I'm doing on the deck. Yeah, this is, I was anticipating your question, so I had a note here saying topic for Q&A. <laughs> Great job, you set me up for success. So here's a, another kind of, so con returning to the concept drift question, which was asked earlier. So one way to anticipate and deal with concept drift is that when concept drift is expected, you can translate it into covariate drift with careful feature engineering. So what you do is that you can add features to learn periodic change over time, and you can add indicators of effects or unexpected events, and this might not even need labeling and additional data. So if you go back to our to our credit risk example with the COVID world, if you have a, if you are tracking something about whether the world is in COVID or not, or if you're tracking other macroeconomic indicators like unemployment rate as part of the features in your model, then certain kinds of anticipated uh, concept drift can be handled in that way. So one of my uh, co-founders used to work at uh, uh, at a company that was building marketing models for retail and search models for retail. And one of the things he had observed in his time was that those models worked really, really well, except when they had sales. When the retailer had a sale, the model just went completely crazy. Because if you just think about training one model, for both the scenarios and you're not keeping track of sales using some kind of special, special indicator like is sales as a feature in the model, then the sales data gets drowned out because this was not like Amazon was not one of their customers. So they were not on sale all the time. They only had the big sales during certain, certain time, seasonal events. This could be something that you anticipate and you track in the model and if you do, then the expected concept drift during sale can get handled through a covariate drift with feature engineering. For the Zillow models also, there's some of that is similar where you could, and I'm sure some of these basic things they would have done, but keeping track of like uh, uh, trend variables, which are keeping track of housing prices changing by region. If that is done well, then some of the prices going down could be tracked, and, and, and that, that, could, that could lead, if those were tracked in the model as features, then you could have translated some aspects of concept drift into covariate drift. Um, another thing is that the drift period may be too insignificant for a retrained model to pick up on, so this is again true of the sales world, but also lots of other examples. Um, and, and finally, sometimes no action may be needed. It might be the case that the model has shifted in a way that it's still reasonable, like risk going up and income is going down. If that's the root cause of the drift, 
then the model is perfectly good. So with that kind of background, like uh, one quick thing I'll say is that when we are monitoring, that involves computing drift on data or metrics over time. And this is kind of one way to approach it. You track drift over time, you do the basics, look at feature data, predictions if available, look at the ground truth data, accuracy of models, track some of the metrics related to consequential drift, so feature importances, distributions of feature importances. Uh, there are some other metrics here as well. And then you can set alerts. If the drift is above a certain threshold that triggers an alert, then you run an automated root cause analysis, and then you go from there to mitigate. So with that, I'll, I'll leave you with this kind of overview of what we have presented. Data drift can happen due to a variety of internal and external causes. Not all drift impacts the model, and that's extremely important. It's important to identify consequential drift, otherwise you'll get overrun with false alerts. There are different classes of metrics to capture different types of drift. There's features, ground truth, model output, and relationships. And we also, I didn't get into this bullet here because it's staying away from our specific product in this talk, but these are the kinds of things that uh, True Arrows products help with. There's also how to mitigate drift. It's not just about retraining. It's important to understand type and root causes. Uh, some, in some cases, you want to retrain. You want to add certain kinds of features, drop features, do fairly directed feature engineering. There's data quality issues that can also get surfaced, which need to be addressed. So there's kind of a nice comprehensive map of the different paths to being effective in monitoring and debugging. And that's, at a, at a high level, is the connection between these two pillars. Historically, a lot of the attention in monitoring is on metrics, and it's extremely important to have broad coverage of metrics and custom metric support and so forth. That by itself is not enough, though. It's, it's, it's critical that you also have ways of doing fast, precise debugging with root cause analysis, and therein lies the hidden connection between monitoring and explainability. Thank you very much.